What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm here with my good boy, Aiden Broyles. He is a sophomore chemical engineering major from Fort Worth, Texas, and he is here to talk about everything that God is doing in his life um, and his experience here at Texas A&M. So glad to have him on. Uh, but without further ado, we're going to pray this episode in so we can get started. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. It's been a hot minute since we've gotten to uh, record anything, but I'm so glad that we get to um, talk with Aiden, um, that we get to have this conversation. I pray that it's glorifying to you. I pray that we could talk about things openly and honestly with one another as brothers in Christ, that we can lift your name up high, that we can lift the names of others outside of this room up, God, that this would not be a time to tear anybody down or gossip, but that it would truly be um, an experience and a conversation that is, is glorifying to you, Lord. Lord. Um, and it's in your precious son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Bro. Yes, sir. Aiden Frat Daddy Broyles. <laughs> the one and only. The one and only. How have you been, bro? I'm good. Life is crazy, but um, just going going through um, going through the motions right now. Uh, it's been really, really insane, but um, finding peace throughout all the craziness yeah. has been really good. Mm -hmm. You got tests and stuff? Uh, yeah, so my, uh, my fluids test uh, didn't go so hot, <laughs> but it didn't go hot for everyone. So okay. it's like kind of, you know, we, we're, so we're all struggling together. But that was last that was last week. Next week, no exams, so we're free and easy. But that means papers. I have, you know, English paper due, chemistry paper due, just a lot of stuff I got to get done. But we're making it work. You know? Got you. You're okay. in 210, right? Yeah, 210. Ooh. How do you like that? I don't. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's a lot of it's a lot of writing, and I enjoy writing, but I, I don't I enjoy writing when I feel like I have to, and you know I'm being forced to write these really boring documents. Not necessarily like creative writing, which is definitely more my jam, but it's, it's definitely not my favorite. It's still really interesting though. Like it's it's you know learning how to communicate effectively. Um, and convey ideas is really interesting. Yeah, that's super awesome. I remember I took technical business writing online and it was probably the best decision I ever made because I didn't have to go to class yeah. and learn how to do a comma or use a semicolon. I just got to do a discussion post about it and I was done. Yeah, so you Didn't have to think or, about it at all. <laughs> you gotta go learn all about that and do a bunch of assignments for it. Yeah, but uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, you are a chemical engineering major Kemi, like 90% yes, of the people here at the chapel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, how has that been for you beyond just um, the workload and the classes that you've taken? How has Christ shown up and manifested himself in your major? Has he been directing you and guiding you any specific direction? Like how has he made your experience within your major different? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing for me is the classes that I'm in are you know, they're, they're challenging in and of themselves. Right. But I was um, so last semester I read a book by Mark Batterson called Play the Man, okay. and um, it, in that book he talks about like finding um, God's creativity in like the things we learn. Like, because people like to downplay, oh, God really didn't you know create. This and this was just formed by a random bang. Um, but like when, when I'm reading through my orga organic chemistry textbook and I see how all the reactions work all the time and how the shapes themselves like direct the, um, the reaction, it's, it's really cool. Like there's, you can't just like, oh, that, that's neat. That works. No, like it's actually, um, you know, there's something there. And it's like for someone like me who is, who knows, you know, that God created everything, it's really obvious. Mm -hmm. Um, so like the God's shown uh, his presence in ways like that through, through chemistry, through how math works. Um, every once in a while I just take a step back and I'm like, isn't this crazy how this mm -hmm. all works? You know, yeah. like people make discoveries, but God knew about those all, like from yeah. day one, you know, he knew that if you react, I don't know, X with Y, you'll get Z. And uh, we as humans are slowly learning these things that God is like hidden to us, like mm -hmm. we're discovering. And I feel like that's like God kind of just revealing his, his creation, you yeah. know, his, his um, marvelous creation to us throughout our daily life. Dude, that's so cool. Um, and I think that's definitely something um, that I've heard resounding from like anybody who is in math or science is just how raw and real God can be in the empirical sense because you have the the formulas and the theories and everything lining up so beautifully but you also have the creator who instruments all of this um wittgenstein um i think said it this way that 
the most crazy thing and the most beautiful thing about the world is not how it works, but that it works. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I love quoting that. It's literally one of my favorite quotes because it's just so true and so real that we shouldn't be able to understand things. The world has no right or obligation to make sense to us. We have no right to think that we should be able to understand any facet of it, forget all of it, like any part of it. But God and his like mercy and his grace has revealed to us how everything interacts, that we can have agency within it, that we can make these discoveries about medicine and technology and, and engineering and figuring out how to create anything that makes life better, I think starts with the revelation from God that this is how these fe- these pieces fit. Oh, you know, it's, it's looking at the puzzle and realizing that somebody had to make this, somebody had to cut each corner the way that it is so that it can be put back together and that it can reveal something about not only what it is, the thing being created, but also the creator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's really, really awesome. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's super cool as well that while there's nothing new under the sun, there's plenty new under the surface. Mm -hmm. And so everything that has been made, like has been made by the Lord. And there's no reason for us to expect that, you know, things are going to be radically different in terms of the laws of nature, the laws of physics. It's not like anything is up for debate in that department, but there's so much yet to be discovered that we might have a flawed conception or an incomplete conception for better words Mm -hmm. about how God has put everything together. We think we have a pretty good idea now because we can run tests and see, oh, look, an apple falls and there's gravity for you. Yeah. Or how does fluid run through a pipe? I have no idea how that works and the pressure oh, and stuff goodness. like that. <laughs> but there's still so much to be discovered because I think you and Marshall or somebody was talking about like steady state and hope for the best. I assume steady state and hope for hope the for best the was best. like the title of your group me because in any problem you have the theory and as long as everything is in a vacuum, the theory works. But as soon as you put, as soon as you take the vacuum away, then you're faced with this reality that not everything fits in this neat little box that oh, we yeah. can describe. And so there's still so much left to to be described and to be discovered in terms of math, in terms of science and physics. And that's exciting because it means that God still has stuff that he wants to reveal to us and show us and stuff that he wants to give us so that we can make life better for ourselves and be better to one another. Mm -hmm. But until then, it's like we can't rest on our coattails and be like, here's the theory, here's the solution, and we have everything wrapped up in this tight little bow. Like there's never an end to science. And I think the best scientists understand that and have this humility about them. Oh yeah, for sure. They know yeah. that um, you know, uh, things are constantly being discovered, mm-hmm. and it's like a continuous search for um, the knowledge that God has, and He's slowly revealing to us, uh, mm-hmm. you know, His multiple, um, you know, ways to, through the bio, through the biologies and chemistries, and you know, uh, other sciences. You know, English. Uh, I could say you could even say like we're learning you know, our language is constantly evolving yeah. that way too. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it it it, it um, encompasses so many things. Yeah. Really what neat. I know you've taken quite a few classes by this point in terms of engineering, math, calculus, chemistry. Where have you seen, I guess, that puzzle piece, you know, everything starting to fit together? When was a, a defining moment for you when you started to think, oh my gosh, here's this amazing connection. And without this connection, like, it almost feels like the glory of God would fall short in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, like there was something about this math homework that it surface level was so mundane but then when you see how beautifully everything fits together you're like here is god and here is christ holding stuff together yeah for sure i think that the class for me was organic chemistry okay because um it's you know when you're doing organic chemistry you have your reaction your mechanism so you've got for instance your um your alkene and it's being reacted with a um certain type of reagent and you produce something um and for most of the time that works every time you Mm -hmm. know and it's really, it's really wild to think like, hey, how did these scientists, um, you know, figure out that, um, like, if you react to certain structure with this, like, you make things, and you can create so many um, amazing, you know, like, um, they've created pharmaceuticals, they've created, you know, cures for disease by literally putting puzzle pieces together, you know, mm-hmm. um, synthesizing these really cool chemicals to just to just do amazing things and so that's where i kind of it was one night last semester in my ochem one class i was really struggling kind of it was a rough time 
and I, I might have been in this room like writing reactions on this whiteboard. <laughs> I mean, I have no idea. But I was just like, I kind of had I like took a step back, and I'm like, how, how? Like this is really yeah. cool, you know? It's different, and you know, it's 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 hard. Like it's a hard class. Don't get me wrong. But it's so different than any other class I've taken. And this might sound like I'm, um, I guess, overanalyzing, but I really do think that God kind of revealed himself to me a little bit in organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just kind of like showing like, hey, it's a completely different science that I've never been exposed to before. And you can see, like, here is what I've created. um, And I've created this awesome ability to create these um, life save possibly life saving, you know, um, compounds. Yeah. Through putting puzzle pieces together, isn't that crazy? Mm-hmm. Like God is has a has such a creative way of doing that. Like like by putting puzzle pieces together to create compounds that can cure, you know, diseases like polio and smallpox. Yeah, bro. I mean, yeah. You just you think about vaccinations and you think about how much we take for granted the fact that we have eradicated disease, Mm -hmm. you know, not just provided treatments for isolated cases or home remedies, like we can actually kill disease and we know how, like we can wage war against disease. And in many ways, death, I think that's, you know, the long-term vision of medicine is we're trying to prolong life. We're trying to wage war against death. And we think about that um, physically, and there could be a little bit of vanity there in terms of, you know, we weren't meant to live forever on this earth. The right. body is temporal and we are temporal. Um, and there's so much spiritual life to be found in Christ. But it's amazing how much Christ honors the body and now how much he honors the physical. And while this world is dying, there is still an attempt being made, I think, by Christ through people who are discovering these medicinal things, these cures and the chemistry and all that stuff, to preserve life. Um, and, and to give life as much chance as it can to spread the message of the gospel. When I was doing um, kinesiology before I switched into English, I had to think just in terms of my applications for stuff, for scholarships, why do I want to be a kines major? And on surface level, it was like, I want to coach yeah. uh, tennis. I didn't have this big plan. And so I was praying trying to think about, God, what is the purpose of this if not vanity, you know, because I was thinking in terms of you want to be healthy, you want to just live longer, you want to do this. What's the point of living longer if there's an eternity to wait for? Mm -hmm. You know, and part of that is just stewarding God's gift that he's given us. And we want to be better stewards and have at least the potential to honor um, the bodies he's given us better. That's part of it. But also I was starting to think about you have all these weird case studies and they're a bit in between in terms of how valid they are. especially with prolonging life, you know, eat like this and you'll add two years to your life. Mm -hmm. Eat, you know, exercise like this and you'll add two or three years to your life. But you think about even adding a day, adding a week, adding a month, if you can do that by stewarding your body better through the revealed knowledge that Christ has given to scientists, to researchers and stuff like that, how much more ministry can you do? Again, it's, it's the potential for ministry because you have Tons of people who live longer and don't know Christ, but then there's more opportunity for them to hear Christ. So even if you're not immediately doing ministry, the opportunity to be ministered to, assuming that you take care of the the temporal body that we have, not necessarily in a vain way, but you have this ability to be sanctified even more because of this medicine, um, because of these new discoveries that we're making in, in every realm of science, nutrition, chemistry, physics. We understand how to avoid stress on our body. We're really working on getting the message out so people actually avoid putting stress on their body. Mm -hmm. But a hundred years ago, that was superstition. That was myth. That was, hey, cool down, take a chill pill, you know, really idiomatic and just telling people, you know, just nice suggestions. But now it's like, we have medicine for anxiety. We have medicine for depression. We have medicine for temperament problems and mood disorders and stuff like that. So we have the ability to improve quality of life and for all of the debate in terms of whether that's the natural you, whether that should be, you know, scriptural or not, Mm -hmm. I think anything that improves the quality of life without sacrificing like an adherence to the word and an adherence to like God, Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's something that Christ will honor. I think so too. Yeah. And as long as, I mean, I guess the medicine as well, there's just debate in terms of how it's produced and how manipulative the, the manufacturers are and how honest and open about the 
um, like you don't want to mislabel stuff. You don't want right. to commit fraud and everything like that. So there's still tons of work to be done. And as long as it's being done by people, there's going to be sin in the middle of it. There's going to be brokenness in the middle of it. But again, there's just so much potential for ministry, you know, oh, physical absolutely. ministry that leads into the eternal. That's not necessarily vanity. Yeah. No, I think you're, I think you hit it right on the spot uh, because, you know, we are, you know, we're, we're destined to live in, in eternity with, with Christ and with God. Um, and it's, you know, you have to understand that all of these amazing discoveries, like they're, they're going to be used. God's going to use them for his, he's going to let his will be done. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- whether that might be through prolonging life, uh, expecting so more people can hear about God right. or, um, you know, just, just giving us more time to serve others and to make someone's day better. Like, um, doing things like that. God is using these amazing discoveries um, through all science, all engineering, you know, to do these awesome, uh, amazing things in his creation, understanding that he can be glorified through that. Mm -hmm. How is it that you personally ended up in engineering? Did you just have a particular knack for it in high school? Um, Did you figure it out as you were coming into college, like started with general, figured out you liked it? Or what, what was the story there in terms of how Christ actually led you into this um, discipline? Yeah, so I I like to say I'm probably the least engineer of any (laughs) engineer you'll meet because in high school, um, we had this program where you could like do design classes and like principles of engineering and things of that nature. And I had a lot of my friends were taking the class. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it. Why not? You know, I kind of want to learn more about engineering, learn more about what it's like. And I I, I liked the class. I mean, it was a fun class, but my sophomore year I took chemistry, and I had already like been very interested in chemistry from a young age, like you know, pouring baking soda in vinegar and watching it go poof. Like that was like really cool. Um, not poof, but that's, <laughs> that's besides the point. Poof. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but but my chemistry teacher, he was a really great guy, Mr. Gomes. Um, he was just super kind, and uh, he understood that I had a, had a passion and wanted to learn more about this this science, and so. He would let me come into his classroom like after school and just, you know, hang out like like in the stock room. You know, we had a bunch of chemicals and he just let me hang out there. And sometimes he'd, have, he'd ask me to help him like set up experiments and things of that nature. And and I from kind of from there, I because when I was little, I wanted to be a, a doctor, I wanted to be a surgeon okay. uh, just because I've I seen the cartoons of the yeah. doctors putting their hands in them. You know, I thought that was that was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had no idea what that would look like, you know, later on. It wasn't until junior year of high school when I decided, okay, I either want to major in chemistry or chemical engineering. And senior year, I took calculus, um, which is kind of an upper level math, you know, right. um, they teach it here at a and And my calculus teacher, she was another really great a person. Her name is Miss Murphy, and she was my freshman geometry teacher, pre-cal teacher, and calculus teacher. And okay. there was a time when I was really panicking. I'm like, I don't know where I'm going to go to college. And so I emailed her for some reason, and she yeah. she responded back with a great email talking about like, um, you know, no matter where you go, you're going to you know do amazing things. And it was just really comforting. Oh. So I um, applied to A and M, thinking either want to do chemistry or chemical engineering. And I opted to do chemical engineering just because it was practical. It's easier to switch from chemical engineering to chemistry than the other way around. Um, but but freshman engineering was hard. I hated yeah. it. <laughs> uh, it was not easy. My um, but what really helped me there is my engineering professor, Dr. Mendoza. She was pro- she's probably my favorite professor at A and M. She was very much like a mom, very caring. Uh, she loved her students. She called us her beloved students. It was um. so sweet, and. When I in second semester was uh, significantly harder. When I was like really, I got a bad bad grade on it. Like like a fifty on an exam. Okay. And I went to Dr. Mendoza's office. And I was like, Dr. Mendoza, is there anything I can do to like to bring my grade up? And she was just very, very caring, very like loving in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was a Christian. She she yeah. made it known she was a Christian, and you could see it through her actions. And mm. it was just so great. But um, I feel like God is kind of. You put these instructors, the reason I say that is he puts yeah. these instructors in my life to kind of like to guide me um, because mm-hmm. my, with Mr. Gomes, Ms. Murphy, and, and Dr. Mendoza, I mean, all my teachers throughout all grades have, have impacted me. Um, but those three in particular left such like a resounding impact on my, where I am right now yeah. academically that, you know, I can't not mention them. Um, and 
I've just been very at peace with where I am right now. I feel like God is wanting me to be a chemical engineer. Um, now, I don't know if I'll be, be a chemical engineer for the rest of my life. He might be using me right now to obtain information about chemical right. engineering uh, in order to do something else. I still don't know. Um, but the reason I say I'm the least of an engineer you ever meet is because I don't like coding. I don't like physics. It feels like all engineers you meet love coding, love physics. I hate coding, hate mm. physics. Um, I, if I could, I'd rather, you know, do, I'd rather sit in the lab and do a bunch of crazy reactions, right. probably get like burn marks on my face <laughs> than sit down and code a script. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I, I know uh, with chemical engineering, it's, it is difficult, but it's so, it, it feels like this is where I need to be. Right. You know, I don't feel um, like I'm not supposed to be here, so to speak. Mm. That's really, really good. I know you hit on the instructors for you, both in high school and in college, whether it was your teachers or your professors, not only encouraging you, um, saying you're going to do great things, but even when you don't do such great things, when you fail the test, they're there to reaffirm your ambition to love and serve in this vocation of yours in chemical engineering. Um, and I think that's really underrated. We talk about teachers occasionally, and I think I hear a lot more negative connotations associated with professors, especially just going through day-to-day -day life in college. Mm -hmm. You hear about, oh, our professor made us do this, or there's so much work in this class, or they didn't change my grade on the test, or they wrote a really hard test, and what was on the test wasn't what was in the notes or in the book or anything like that. It seems to me that there's a lot of negativity associated with teachers, and I think we definitely need to do a better job of edifying the teachers because they are probably the most important edifiers of us in terms of our ambition, in terms of our dreams, um, pushing us towards success because we can all probably name two or three teachers. I pray that everyone can name two or three teachers who have really encouraged them individually to pursue their passions in one way or another. And maybe not even individually and maybe not even recently because for a while, I mean, all middle school and high school, I had zero direction, not necessarily running away from anything or everything, but just didn't know what I was going to do. Even coming into college, didn't know what I was going to do. But when I switched from Kines to English, it wasn't because of any classes I took here at Texas A&M. It was because I remembered in like third and fourth grade, I had Mrs. Whitus and Mrs. Nimi tell me that I was such a great writer. And then in seventh grade, I had Mrs. Ortega tell me, wow, I really like this story. Um, and it was amazing because there was so much talent that I guess I had not tapped into or a love that I just never realized I had. Mm -hmm. This gift that I did not notice for so long because I had forgotten the words that were encouraging me from a very, very young age to be a writer or a communicator or just a creator in general. Like mm -hmm. that's how I think my brain is wired now as I've been doing a lot of self discoveries that I just like creating things yeah. and I have a problem identifying with the things that I make and wanting them to be very, very good. But when I was first coming into college, at least I didn't have a whole lot of affirmation one way or the other. They were just a bunch of voices in my head telling me to find something that I was passionate about. And I wasn't sure I was passionate about anything, which like was stressful mm -hmm. because you don't want to be one of the, the slaves of the clock or the time card or the nine to five. And that not that there's anything wrong with working nine to five, but if you don't love it, then you're not going to love it. Right. You know? And so I was just praying for so long, um, all throughout freshman year, wondering is, is kinesiology the place for me is like science, the place for me. And it turns out that it wasn't. And it was strange the way it did, because when I switched to English, I just didn't even have the plan to change career path. I just was changing the path to the same career because within coaching, you didn't need a Kines degree. You just needed a degree. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to coach and teach, they recommended getting a degree in whatever you wanted to teach. So I was like, well, I probably would teach English because I don't want to teach anything else, right. you know? Um, but then as I got into English, I rediscovered for one, my love for reading and just my love for language and my love for words and just all the interesting conversations that you can have about, um, rhetoric and texts and argumentation and stuff like that. But I also just rediscovered my love for creating um, really anything. Whenever I sit down and write a paper, 
I kind of do that thing where I lock myself in a headspace and I don't come out of it for about six hours. Mm -hmm. I know engineers will do that with code where they just have to be completely tunnel focused right. and on the project and they don't move until it gets done. Like that's the way I am. But those six hours can go by and I won't notice and I'll be happy at the end of it. You know, it's not a, it's not a draining six hours. It can be because I'll usually need a nap afterwards, but <laughs> it's something that I can do. And honestly, I hope I could do just about every day at a nine to five, if that was like my vocation or my job, like it would be more empowering to me and more like upbuilding for me than it would be tearing me down. And I think that's the goal that anybody going into college or going into a major should think about, especially like as a follower of Christ, like is this job gonna be like pulling you down in terms of your faith, in terms of your walk, or is it gonna edify you and build you up? Is it going to encourage you to pursue your relationship with the Lord more and more every single day that you're in the classroom, that you're having conversations with engineers or English majors or wherever you are? Mm -hmm. What is this path that you're going down leading you to and what's along the way, you yeah. know? And that's not to say that if you have a bunch of non-believers in your class, then don't take the class. You actually should probably take the class more because yeah. you, you know, especially with English, I tend to run it and I say this with as much love as I possibly can, because I, I love my classmates, but I run into a lot of people who I just don't agree with, mm -hmm. you know, in one direction or the other. But I think that's been the most helpful thing for me in terms of refining my own faith and refining my own ideas is being able to communicate with these people who are incredibly loving, yeah. who love to talk about things, who love to talk about things that actually have some depth that's more than just how are you doing today, but like, let's try and literally pick apart the universe together and none of us are really you know even scratching the surface we're peeling you know table scraps from like an onion or something or other <laughs> yeah. but i love having those conversations and i love being able to see how god can work through um, this vocation that I really wouldn't have even seen again if it wasn't for those teachers and instructors who would encourage me along. And I think that's just so important to remember to, you know, not just like kiss up to them, but to say thank you at least. Like the least they d deserve is, is a thank you for um, the not so little things that they do every single day to, to keep us in the spirit of education and building ourselves up, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I have such high respect for teachers. Um, with my dad's family, I have a cousin who's a teacher. I have another one who's a uh, music instructor at, at KU, and it feels like I'm surrounded by teachers in my life, and mm -hmm. I have um, teachers and pastors especially, yeah. and I have such you know high regard for them. And it's one thing that's us kind of what I'm coming back to what I was saying. Like God's right now, He's teaching me chemical engineering, but one thing I've always really had a had an interest in is you know teaching high schoolers mm -hmm. um, you know high school chemistry and coaching as well although yeah. um, coaching basketball and so I'm wondering if that's possibly where God might be calling me to is to uh, do to a teacher role mm -hmm. I mean I don't know but given my life my life experience so far and the impact that they've had on me it's almost it's like I want to um, kind of re not return the favor but right. like and to follow in their footsteps for sure mm -hmm. and I think that's so you know, correlative to the Great Commission and to the gospel in terms of you're going to go out and you're going to make disciples, not only disciples of Christ, but in the process of telling the gospel, you have this amazing medium in chemical engineering or English where you can point to Christ or archetypes or just the puzzle again, how everything fits together and see there is something divine about how everything works. There is something divine about how all of these pieces mesh together in a way that we can actually understand, interpret and like extrapolate information from, you know, you have the ability to pull these kids alongside you if you do happen to like go into teaching and say, here is the information that you're gonna need for this test or mm -hmm. for this exam. But here's also the information behind that information, i.e. here is God making this information possible or revealing this information to us, right. you know? And it's amazing to think that there is so much attached to the gospel that the gospel is not, it is a very simple gospel. Um, and, and it's very bare bones in that it's, it's Christ died and came back and he resurrected and he's you know defeated death. That's like the bare bones gospel. But uh, along with that is so much more. And there's so many different lenses and facets of Christ mm -hmm. where he literally is popping up in every single vocation. And I think it's up to us as Christians pursuing these different avenues to find Christ within that vocation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as, as we've been talking about, and to not only find him there, but expose him to the rest of the world. So when people ask you, what do you do? You don't just say, oh, I teach chemical engineering. I can say, you know, or you can say, 
I teach and I disciple and I'm making disciples. And, you know, that might not look like the way that churches make disciples um, and like do these classes or these programs or you have these, you know, meetings at Starbucks for an hour and you talk about your spiritual walk, but you have a teacher and you have students and you have this constant interaction, this relationship Mm -hmm. with them. I can't think of anybody that you spend more time with on a daily basis than teachers and students, especially like coming through, I mean, elementary school, middle school, high school, you spend more time probably with your teachers than you do with your parents in a way, which which is huge, 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 huge. Um, And I think the more that those teachers reflect the image of Christ and project the image of Christ and try to impart that image upon the students, whether or not the students receive that, you can sow it among thorns and they just don't, you know, want to receive it at all. That's fine. But at least having that heart to, to build up, to bear fruit, I think is really, really big. And I've seen that a lot in you, um, not only just in chemical engineering, but also in um, Flick, which you're involved in, which I definitely want to talk about in a minute. But sure. also, and I, what's immediately coming to mind is with the freshman Bible study um, that you lead, that I kind of sit in on because mm-hmm. I like the conversation. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's been amazing to watch you really take the reins in those discussions and not in the super totalitarian way, but in a loving way where you are encouraging people and inviting people into the conversation to say, hey, how is Christ working in your week? You know, most recently, like you, we've been doing this more missional community stuff where we're just talking about life and talking about Jesus and hoping that like the Venn diagram between those two things like comes closer and closer, you know, together and encompasses both circles. Mm-hmm. So I could talk about that, but I, I would have wanted to let you talk about that and kind of give your thoughts on, on freshman Bible study and your experience with that. Sure. So I, um, I kind of accepted the position. I don't want to say real, uh, like hesitantly, right. but when we were having our, um, you know, at the end of last year, we were discussing like our, our plan for, you will see next year, pastor said, hey, we, we need someone to lead the freshman Bible study. And um, I kind of, and I was, I wasn't an officer. I was just kind of on the leadership team. And right. so I, I, everyone kind of looked at me and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. Um, and I was a little nervous at first because, you know, I'm already in my flow staff. I knew by then I was on flow staff okay. and I was very, I guess I was nervous that I wouldn't be able to contribute a lot to the freshman Bible study and um, there's always ways you can improve right. but I have fallen in love with it um, I look forward to Fridays after lab just come come to the chapel and grab some Bibles and have uh, just talk about life that's one thing I really wanted to cultivate was for the first couple of minutes let's just like talk about our lives kind of let our guard down and like you can yeah. rant you can praise God <laughs> you can do whatever you want um, just to kind of build a community with the freshmen. I feel like that's one of the most important yeah. things, especially at our at our chapel here, is to have the freshmen unified because they're going to be with each other all four years. I mean, with the other freshmen or with the other sophomores, like I know I'm very tight with them and freshman Bible study was kind of that catalyst for that. So that was, uh, it was, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that freshman Bible study has been very um, influential to me. I've enjoyed it a lot and just getting to know the freshmen and knowing where they're from, their story, because I don't interact with them as much as I do with my freshman and my flow, which is um, just the fact of the matter. Like my flow is very um, time. It's a huge time. Commitment. Yeah. It takes up a lot of time and I'm always with them. But with the freshman at ULC that we have those same beliefs, um, that's really been really um, empowering to me is knowing that um, my beliefs and there's, you know, perfectly me- meshed together. I mean, sure, we all believe in the simple gospel, but mm-hmm. we all have, you know, this come from the same background and come from the same, you know, um, same kind of similar worldviews in that way. Yeah. Um, so it's been very just fun to watch them grow and become, um, you know, empowered leaders at our chapel here with, with uh, you know, people taking on leadership roles. It's really exciting to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's definitely something that I've noticed as well is how uh, much the class in of itself gets to bond through that time um, because it is a bit smaller here at the chapel. And that's one of the reasons why I love it so much is because you can't be fake, you can't front or anything like that. But if you're not in community, if you're not a part of you know a little bit of the bubble that we have, then you can be drifting on the edges for a while and not find it. And so for me, and I think for you and for these freshmen as well, it's so important to have that initial contact be with people 
who you can consider your peers. There's so much interaction that happens between classes. I mean, we love the freshmen. There's no, you know, class division here in terms of, oh, here are the freshmen and here's the sophomore click and here's the junior click. It's not like that at all. But I think, as you said before, you know, sophomores, the juniors and the seniors are kind of fade away a lot quicker than the freshmen are going to fade away, or at least amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. And so for them to be able to lean in and support one another from the get-go is super important in building those relationships that by, I mean, sophomore, junior, senior year are gonna be so strong and so tight-knit and they're still gonna be present and they're still gonna be active because as much as I would love to say I keep in touch with people who have graduated and left the chapel, I probably send them a text once a month, like once every couple of weeks or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really good to see that. But also, again, how you open every single conversation with talking about life. Mm -hmm. And that's not highs and lows, which we've done before, or like whoops and poops or glads and sads. That is completely free form and completely free flowing, which I really like because it's very easy to think of your had, your, like you're glad and you're sad, and then think, okay, I can just tune out for the rest of discussion and be listening. And there's nothing wrong with listening, but I think in terms of vulnerability and in terms of establishing those relationships and that connection, you've got to be able to open up at a deeper level, you know, with whatever you're comfortable with. But the fact that we push, um, more out of the freshmen or, or we're constantly trying to dig in and see okay like what's actually going on here like let's let's open up with one another if there's something that's genuinely going on let's talk about that for more than 30 seconds because another thing that tends to happen with like glads and sads or like happies and crappies is that you have maybe your 30 seconds of fame and there's a there's a definite time crunch with that form where you you say your two bits and then you're done. Yeah. Whereas if we're talking about life, it's not like we're going around in a circle. We kind of do, yeah. but it's more of a conversation. It's not, I'm going to lecture for my 30 seconds, then pass it down. We're talking with each other about life as it's going on. And eventually we get around the circle, but it's much more interactive. And I think even those little bits of conversation in the middle of, of what could be just another version of hat, like glads and sads, it, it makes a world of a difference over time because it's compounded over the weeks and the semesters. And just, I think, it, like you said the word catalyst, which is in my mind probably the perfect description of it. It just brings the, the reaction um, to completion a lot quicker, mm -hmm. you know, because there, there's so much time that's needed for any relationship, but the more you can talk and have conversation and the deeper those conversations can be off the get-go, which takes some vulnerability and, you know, um, just... I guess I'm trying to think of another word for it, but it, mm -hmm. vulnerability is a good place to start. It takes a lot of vulnerability to, to open up from the get-go, but the reward for that vulnerability is exponential in terms of connection and relationship that you now have to lean into the rest of your four years in college. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, with the freshmen, you know, because they're going to eventually be the leaders of the chapel. Like one day, uh, I'll, I'll be graduated, you'll be graduated, um, and they're going to be the ones who are, you know, leading their own freshman Bible studies yep. for the class of twenty whatever. Um, <laughs> and it's so it's so humbling to think that I'm having a direct impact on their their lives at the chapel or their lives in general. And it really puts it into perspective for me. Like this is something I need to take seriously. I can't take lightly <laughs> because they're going to be the ones who are running meetings on Sunday afternoons. And it's so. It's, it's just amazing to me. And I feel like that's how teachers are. Like they see these students and like one day they're going to, I don't know, be the, the, be the next CEO of whatever billion mm -hmm. dollar company. And it's just, it's so amazing to like understand you're, you're making the impact on yeah. their lives. I mean, yeah, I'm sure like even for the most littlest things, like they could, you know, have a family. I'm sure that a teacher would see that and be overjoyed. Like, look at that. You know, mm -hmm. because I think in the purest sense, their fruit is your fruit as well. Um, and you get to rejoice in that, which is ideal in terms of the Christian community and the church in general, where we do celebrate each other and we celebrate the victories of one another and we try to build each other up in that way. And that doesn't always happen in terms of the, you know, just one on one friendship accountability relationships, which is, is sad in of itself, but I think it's much more natural for somebody who has been a teacher, who has been a student in that kind of relationship to look at it as this, I guess, wellspring where fruit can be born and it is kind of made to be born in a sense, like that's the intent behind it is just mm -hmm. 
to bear fruit from this relationship you're you're getting poured into and you're going to pour out as opposed to just a, a friendship where we can kind of go back and forth but not always be super intentional about anything right um and yeah like you don't want to ever take claim for what god is doing or what the spirit is doing because it's ultimately you know christ who is making the the change in the life both yours and theirs but the fact that we get to witness christ bearing fruit in some small part because of our faithfulness and because of our words that they've received and gone out and you know done and fulfilled is is probably one of the greatest experiences i know for me coaching is is big in that respect where i see just you know players hitting their forehand differently or hitting their backhand differently or just the improvement in general where they eventually could have figured it out on their own Mm -hmm. you know you can kind of feel your way to a good shot eventually yeah but being able to again be a catalyst to that progress as a teacher and as an instructor and when it goes well it is the best feeling in the world because it makes you feel like you know something and that you've done something but then to see their smile on their face as they're playing better and as they're winning more and as they get the confidence because they're winning more to go out and do whatever else that that confidence gives them outside of the tennis court. Yeah, it it builds on itself and like that's its own reward, you know, and just to see them be happy to feel like they now have this skill, even if it's just tennis and hitting a ball with a racket, the fact that that self-esteem is brought up in a way that maybe it wouldn't otherwise have been if that makes a difference for like one second of one day and you've made just a second of difference Mm -hmm. like that's still a victory yeah and that's something that's to be honored by like all of us for one something that we can celebrate here on earth but i'm sure something also that god is glorifying as well it's not just this big impact in one person's life it's like a second of different or a a millisecond of difference in terms of you know improvement or progress like that is victory and it shouldn't be viewed in any light as small you know you, you celebrate victory because if win is a win is a win mm-hmm. you know it's something my coaches always like to say yeah so it's it's really really big yeah absolutely and i promised we would get into flick so we will definitely get into flick um because and i think you're the first flickster i've actually had on which is weird because oh, really? there's a bunch of flicksters around yeah, yeah. but explain for anybody listening who might not be familiar with flows or freshman leadership organizations or specifically with flick and what you guys do on campus and off campus um, run through a little bit of the organization for us how you got involved and also kind of the fruit that you've seen born through that experience these past i guess three four semesters sure so uh flick stands for freshman leaders in christ which is a freshman leadership organization there's about 18 of them at a m and basically what they are is it's a group of about I say about around 60 to 80 freshmen and about 20 to 30 staffers, basically trying to um, give the freshmen leadership abilities through interactions, you know, social interactions, service interactions, whatever that may be. Um, I first found out about Flake. It's actually kind of an interesting story. So I went to fish camp, and my on the way back from fish camp, my counselors were telling me about flows. Like, you have to apply to this flow, you have to apply to that flow. So I went to, there is an all-flow informational and then with the mindset like, okay, I'm going to apply to these certain flows. and But then uh, Flick, Fresh News in Christ, came up there. And I, it caught my attention. And I'm like, oh, Christ, that's 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 different. <laughs> He's uh, a pretty cool guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that guy. I know a guy. <laughs> Funny. Oh, dear. But um, so I, you know, they're, they're the only flow that kind of like resonated with me. I was like, okay, this seems, seems really cool. So I went to the informational, I applied, and my interview was horrible. I was sick, I had a sore throat, I was talking like this, I'm like, yeah, I love God. <laughs> it was really it was really bad. But somehow, like, you know, I was accepted, um, probably by God's doing, you know, he probably wanted me to be there. Um, and I'll get into more of that later. But <clears throat> what I what I thought what was going to be was like like I think small C freshman is in Christ, like, oh, we're not gonna like curse, we're not gonna like do anything bad, you know, but but we're still just like all Christians, you know, we're kind of going through the motions. But um, what I found was something completely different. Like yeah. a group of people who are on fire for God and staffers who just want to pour um, their knowledge of Christ into the freshmen and just grow them as leaders in Christ is so. This is so amazing just to just to just to think about it. So for freshman year, I was on the kids committee, which. Um, does kids ministry obviously in the name so on every friday night we go to a kids ministry uh, pioneers friday church and basically we 
pick up kids from around Bryan College Station, bring them to this uh, little church out in Steep Hollow, uh, yeah, I believe, yeah, Steep Hollow, and basically play play with them. Like, we teach yeah. them about God, we feed them a dinner, play games with them. I think I got really strong calf muscles by just <laughs> carrying kids on my back. All Like, we'd run around. It was so much fun. Um, but just serving, serving in that ministry is very influential on me. I became a lot more outgoing because, I mean, you can even attest to this. Yeah. As a freshman, <laughs> I was shy. I was quiet. I just wanted to to go to church and then call it good and go th- go live my life. But Flick said, um, no, you're going to be, a, you're going to be a, 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 you're going to be on fire for God. You're not just going to go to church. You're mm-hmm. kind of made for more. Yeah. Um, and that was what applied or kind of pushed me to apply for staff is to kind of return the favor, give back to the class of 22. And now I'm here, I'm in charge of the committee called the on campus committee, um, which basically we find an on-campus organization to help out with. This year, it's the Baptist Student Ministry. There, they have on their Friday nights. They have time for chai. Time for chai. Yeah, <laughs> um, such a fun time. A uh, bunch of Indian students come. We play games with them, have conversations with them. And recently, so there is a uh, an Indian student. His name is Abhinav, who taught us how to play a game called Literature. They call it Lit because it's easier to say. Yeah. Um, but it's like all my freshmen love it. And we've had really good conversations with people just by playing cards. Um, but but besides that, um, Flick has really been a really good community for me. In, in addition to ULC, it's a lot. It's a different kind of Christianity, I'm gonna say, because you know here at here at uh, ULC we're all Lutheran and we all you know have the same Lutheran faith. But there, you know, people there's Catholics, there's Baptists, there's non-denominational people, people of all different Christianities. But we still all believe the same, you know, same sort of yeah. gospel that Jesus died on the cross and resurrected, rose from the dead on the third day. And it's really been so great to watch, like my freshman there. Um, Initially, they went to Time for Chai and just hung out with themselves, but now they're inviting other students to play. Two of my kids stayed till like midnight last night, Dang. just like singing songs with them. So nice. it's so cool just to watch them become bolder and um, making connections and cultivating relationships with those with those Indian students who are very nice people. Like they're so welcoming. Um, one student named Gotham invited me to his house for dinner. And I was, and I had dinner, and it was some of the best food I ever had. Mm. And, and and I'm hearing stories from my freshmen about the relationships they're forming, and it's so, it's so amazing, just to me. It's been very, it's been really awesome. I've yeah. really enjoyed it. It's made my freshman year, or sophomore year, too, um, so, so awesome here at A and M. That's amazing, and I love um, the fact that I think you mentioned somewhere in the middle there that while you all come from different breeds or different backgrounds within Christianity, that you're able to truly unify under just Christ, Mm -hmm. you know, and and truly the simple gospel of, look, Christ was real. He died and was resurrected. And because of that resurrection, we now have victory over sin and death. And that's just the message. It's the good old gospel. And there's organizations like Flick that celebrate the diversity within the unity, you know, diversity of gifts, diversity of background, diversity of just like gender, race, sex, and like all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's amazing to see how unity does not necessarily look like uniformity in the sense that you don't all have to have the exact same confessional doctrine. You don't all have to believe every single itty bit the same thing about Christ because Christ reveals himself to all of us in different ways, first and foremost. And there's certainly things that are not helpful um, when it comes to doctrine, but you know, you, you've you got different denominations. I don't think there's anything to be a big stumbling block in terms of that, you know? Um, big church, small church, you know, different backgrounds, this and that. We, we all worship the same God and that's super, super cool. And on top of that, that, um, y'all are dedicated to service. Mm -hmm. It's not just a leadership organization where I think about a lot of my leadership organizations in high school where you get some food, you talk about doing stuff, and then you go home. You know, like you have like this leadership fund that's pretty much devoted to buying pizza, Uh (laughs) which isn't bad because you do have, you know, certain things that go on, but y'all are 
constantly serving at the BSM, serving off campus. You have different committees, different ministries that you are a part of on a weekly basis, I'm oh, yeah. sure. It's insane. It's, it's incredibly active. It's incredibly consistent. And I think that really puts into your heart and into your soul um, a desire to serve. And you see the fruit of consistent service. Mm -hmm. um, has that been your experience? Oh, yeah, I, I absolutely. Um, through all kinds of service or through all kinds of service opportunities with um, Flick, we have two service projects every semester. No, no, one every semester, so two right. every year, called Big Project. And basically, what we do there is all of Flick. We go to a town in Texas and we just serve like the whole weekend. We're serving. So this uh, semester, last semester, we were in Waco and. My group, we helped out at the World Hunger Relief Farm, just basically doing yard work. Like we cleaned up their property, um, helped like pull some weeds. We just wanted to make sure they were in a better um, condition to f to uh, grow food for the Waco community. Because um, what they said is that the McLennan County is in a, um, a food desert. Like they don't have a lot of okay. uh, opportunity for fresh food and a very high population that are like not, not super well off financially. Right. So they, they want to get, you know, they can't. They don't have the money to go buy fresh produce, so they resort to buying, you know, pretty cheap fast food, mm -hmm. and that leads to a very unhealthy population. So they're there serving um, the community by providing food to them and throughout the whole world. You know, it's in their name, World Hunger Relief. So we were there helping out and just doing like, like you can tell, they're not super fun tasks. Like no one's <laughs> gonna want to like wake right. up and be like, I want to go move logs. I want to go. Let's see. There was, um, I think I was in charge of like pulling up dead limbs from like a like a, a plant. I don't even know if okay. they're limbs, just like plants. But watching that was really, really good. And then every committee that's in Flick does something with service. Like mm -hmm. um the uh, the snow the snow committee, it's in the service and outreach. It's in their name. They go and um reach out to the people on campus. They go try to just serve others um in different different ways. There's the, the fundraising committee called the Drazers. They um, they serve in a more, um, I guess, a more financial way. Yeah, like they're um, they're planning profit shares and um, designing merchandise to be sold to raise money and everything. Basically, every I can go on for all six committees. Mm -hmm. um, every committee does something that's helping out the mission of Flick, which is to uh, to make servant leaders. Mm -hmm. um, it's in it's in the name. Like we're making servant leaders, freshmen who have a mindset of service, of putting others before themselves, and yeah. understanding because God came to serve. It's in Mark ten forty five. Um, what does it say? Like, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Mm. I think that's what it's. Yeah, sure. that sounds right. Yeah, and I think a couple other places too, because I think that's one of the few that gets repeated throughout all four Gospels, and just kind of shows you the character of Christ is not what everyone thought it was going to be when it came to like kingliness mm -hmm. or like being a ruler over the world. He's like, I think that verse is also where he's talking to the disciples and they're asking to be at his right hand or his left hand. And he's like, look, the Pharisees give positions and the, and the Romans and the centurions, they look for status and authority, but not so with you for the greatest among you will be a servant and, mm -hmm. and the highest or the first among you will be like last. Yeah, you know, I'm butchering that in terms no, yeah. of a direct quote, paraphrasing it certainly, but um, the, the heart and soul of the gospel is Christ's, you know, perfect representation of the Father's, like, service. Mm -hmm. um, like, he did us the greatest service in the world in, you know, defeating sin and death. He serves as, like, our high priest and our intercessor and all that stuff. And when you think about that in terms of um, how we conventionally even talk about church, it's a church service, you know, mm -hmm. which always kind of blew my mind and I've been thinking about it a lot more recently in terms of what that actually means and it shows you a lot of what the intent behind church was supposed to be. It's like this is a service to y'all. This is not a social club. This is not a social hour. This is a service that, you know, Christ is doing for us where he's continuing to remind us and edify us um, and, and build us up with his word, with, I mean, just the truth that is in his gospel and his death and resurrection, you know, every single week. Um, it's not, I mean, it, there's certainly fun to be had and there's certainly glory to be had in the social aspect of church and the relationships right. and stuff like that but the primary aspect of church and what it's meant to do is for the for the body of the believers to continue to grow and, and edify one another and that um 
happens through service. Mm -hmm. That happens through us coming together and talking about what's going on this week. What can I do to help you with anything that is going on this week? If you have a test that's going on, can I like bake you brownies? Mm -hmm. Like our girl Lydia at Prairie Brews, like every single week, she like- All the time. All the time. She bakes religiously, but it's also partially because she's so, so good at baking and she loves it, but also because she's so servant hearted and knows that there's a need to be met every single week mm -hmm. um and she does it without asking and like i don't think we've ever had to ask her you know to serve she always offers that service because oh, yeah. she, because she sees a need and she meets that need and more than meeting that need she usually goes above and beyond and just absolutely slays it mm -hmm. you know and i think the more um we live out that same servant heart, you know, that, that Christ had and really looking for opportunities to serve um, in, you know, really, I guess, visible ways, but also like in invisible ways in terms of you can hold a door open for somebody or you can buy somebody's lunch or you can just be praying for them. You can be praying for them behind the scenes and that takes um, a whole lot of dedication and that can be done with a whole lot of consistency in terms of just lifting up tests and lifting up people as they're going through the stress of college and life. You know, they don't have to see or witness you praying for the fruit to be born. You right. know, that, that's not how prayer works. It's not meant to be a public spectacle, but it still is such, you know, a, a servant hearted thing to do where you are getting on your knees before the Lord and beyond praying for yourself and your needs, you are praying for the needs of others, which I think is really, really big and something we can all do without having to like look the extra mile for this for this random act of kindness, you know? Right. There there's certainly like glory in that as well. But I think I think prayer is probably the best and most like effective place to start in terms of developing that servant heart. Yeah, we were talking about it yesterday at Fresh and Bible Study. Mm -hmm. Like, we're talking about, um, you know, in Ephesians, putting on the full armor of God. Heck yeah. But right after that, it goes talking about, like, how do you do this? You pray. Yeah. Like, that is, like, the most powerful tool. And prayer is something that has definitely become a huge part of my life. Even mm -hmm. more, I mean, it's always been a big part, but even more so in college. Um, because when I was at home, like, living at home in high school and stuff, I'd always have my mom and dad to talk to. Like, yeah. I can go say, hey, mom. Life is, life sucks right now. <laughs> I need some help, or dad, yeah. like, hey, li hey, dad, needs some, you know, help with this. But here I am at college without my parents. I mean, I can still give them a call, and they're still going to answer my call. Right. But when it's when life is really just getting you down, you can always pray, and God will always listen. Uh, mm -hmm. Last last year in Flick, um, my committee led a meeting about prayer, and it was so amazing for me. I uh, I was reading through because um, our our topic was about. Um, prayer, prayers of Thanksgiving. Yeah. So one, so I basically like our whole lesson was in um, First Thessalonians, uh, chapter five. Let me okay. see. I right. definitely highlighted this. Open first. that good book. I love the Bible, dude. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it says here um, First Thessalonians verses sixteen and seventeen. I guess sixteen through eighteen. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for mm -hmm. you. God wants us to continually give thanks and to pray without ceasing. It literally says verbatim, verse seventeen. And mm -hmm. in my my little explanation, it says we cannot verbally pray at all times, but it is possible to be in the spirit of prayer and ever ready to pray. And I feel like that is something yeah. that we, um, as Christians, kind of we know that's what we're supposed to do. But something that I mean, even I like, I'm not saying mm -hmm. I'm perfect because I definitely fall short. Yeah. But just being a ready to pray for whatever. Like if someone's going through life and it's just you know crappy, just realizing oh i can pray for you and mm -hmm. i want to pray for you wanting yeah. to pray for others that's so big and i think the the thing that immediately hits me as you were reading those verses um and i'll repeat them again uh rejoice always pray without ceasing give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of god in christ jesus for you the second little article that's talking about pray without ceasing that's literally sandwiched in between the imperative rejoice always and give thanks in all circumstances so it kind of gives you a context with which to pray and we kind of have all these different lovely formulas we've been taught in terms of like adoration confession thanksgiving and supplication and right. like but i think scripture kind of just you know supports that for one because that's a good formula to follow if you're going to follow like a formula for prayer but just says rejoice give thanks, 
pray. And, that, and that's the sandwich with which prayer is like kind of held. Like prayer is the meat of the sandwich where you have both rejoice and thanksgiving. So that kind of gives you the the context of like, what can my prayer look like, you know? Mm-hmm. And there's certainly room for like, I mean, lament when life is crappy. You're like, God, I don't know what's going on here. Please, can you help a brother out right now? Right. Like, that's a perfectly okay prayer to have. And God welcomes those prayers like all throughout scripture. But I think ideally, because for one, we have the gospel and we have the knowledge already that we that everything is going to be fine. Mm-hmm. You know, we are told explicitly in scripture, rejoice and give thanks. Yeah. You know, and I think that kind of has to be forced sometimes where you have to definitely get in the mindset of, okay, what do I have to be thankful for? What do I have to be like, joyous about mm-hmm. and and then to proclaim that joy and to give god that thanks it takes some discipline it does it, it, it takes a lot of discipline but prayer is the perfect place for that discipline to manifest mm-hmm. it's the perfect place for us to say to god you are good thank you for being good i know you're going to take care of this i know life is crappy right now but you are so unbelievably faithful and i trust that you have already taken care of this right now whatever it is whether it's a test or a relationship or just miscellaneous stuff that's going wrong that the yeah. devil is trying to work through like god is so good mm-hmm. you know and i think one of the best bits I ever heard about prayer, and I definitely can't claim it for myself, yeah. is that it started with a question in terms of like, well, if God can already know our hearts and the spirit intercedes for us, then why do we need to pray out loud or why do we need to pray in our head at all? Mm-hmm. And the pastor I think I heard this from was saying that the purpose of prayer is not only so God can hear you because it's there's the communication and the relationship, it's so you can hear you. Mm-hmm. And so you can hear the thoughts and so your heart can actually be made manifest to yourself and all the things that you've been pushing down in your spirit can finally well up and overflow so that you are bringing into consciousness, it's a little Freudian, but like you can bring into consciousness all of the sin and the brokenness and the struggles that you've been having. And finally, once that's out in the open, you can start to realize the steps to take in order to in order repent. to deal with that, to repent and to seek out community and accountability. Like you start being able to work through that, you know, with God and with other people. Cause I know for me, like I have to talk things out in order for them to make sense or I have to write them out. Like I have to see it. Yeah. Like whatever's in here has to come out here somehow in some way. And so I think like Make it prayer, tangible. Exactly, exactly. Even though it's like the words are still an idea and you have you're just putting it on paper in a different way. It's amazing how much articulating that and just putting it to paper or putting it to words instead of just like letting everything sit in your brain where it can just toss and turn and you know be manipulated by satan really Mm -hmm. as soon as you start speaking to god and you start speaking especially his truth and praying through scripture you get this sense of peace you know and that's i think we were talking about earlier before the podcast started where you've been looking through Philippians 4 um, and I think that's such a great verse even though we like kind of hit on it a lot in churches so there's a reason we hit on it a lot because it's like do not be anxious about anything but in everything with prayer and supplication make your requests be made known to God and the peace of God will you know which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus it's like there's the promise for you in a nutshell mm-hmm. and then just a couple of verses afterwards you have Paul stating just so boldly hey I know what it's like to be in want. I know what it's like to be in need, but I also know what it's like to be content. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's like how he gets there is immediately after he's talking about prayer. Like, is it any wonder those two things, those two comments are so close together? I don't think so. No. You know, like, I don't think God is a God of coincidence. I think those words are like in conjunction for a purpose because it's like prayer leads you to that confidence and that peace to say, I can do all things, not on my own, but by the power of Christ alone right. who strengthens me and builds me up. And it's Correct. like prayer is how that connection is made. And I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah for sure. No, but we were also talking about, and I, you can definitely explain this a little bit more than I could because it's more of what you've been going through in Scripture, something in Joshua? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, let me flip to it. So my, in my flow, we have guy times. So that's basically where like all the guys in the on-campus committee basically like kind of do what we do at Freshman Bible Study. We talk about life. And um, one thing I challenge them with is to memorize just a verse from the Bible. It yeah. can be any verse, a verse that's been on your mind, on your heart. 
And um, I did it too because, of course, I want to you know memorize scripture. I feel like that's a super valuable tool for mm-hmm. all for all people. Right. Um, so the verse I chose to memorize comes from Joshua chapter twenty four, verse fifteen, and it says, "If it is evil, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, mm. whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord." And the reason I chose this verse, I always called it the the me and my house verse because yeah. I know that. Somewhere in the verse, um, you know, it says, and it's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But I wanted to kind of get an appreciation for the context and learn what it's about. And um, it says here, it says here, um, was it? Um, yeah, so it's, it, it's, it very much takes a, um, a definitive stance. Like mm-hmm. for, you know, on this, and if it's evil in your eyes, choose this day. You know, make your case now and mm. go from there and do what you will, you know? And so that's one thing that I uh, really kind of had to come to grips with in college is that I'm going to have to make decisions. I can either decide to, you know, serve the gods of this world or serve the Lord. And I kind of, as I was memorizing this verse, I did say my claim. I was like, okay, I'm going to serve the Lord. And I have to realize that I cannot serve. It says somewhere else in scriptures, you cannot serve two, two masters. masters. Yes. You either love one and hate the other. Or, yeah. Yeah. And so this verse really just kind of cemented that. Like as for me and my house and my house could be, um, cause obviously I don't have a house. I don't have like a family <laughs> that just scares me. Me right and my now. apartment shall serve the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that'd probably be better. Me and my dorm. Oh goodness. But, um, <laughs> me and my people in my life that yeah. I have influence over. Me the and freshmen. the fam. Yeah, there you go. My roommates, my freshmen, uh, my friends, we will serve the Lord. And of course, I don't have jurisdiction over them. I can't like, you know, make them serve the Lord, obviously, because I'm not them, but I can do what I can to l- bring them to God, to communicate to them that that God calls us to serve him and I want you you all to serve the Lord. And I know for me, I can decide for myself, like I'm going to serve God. However that might look like in my life, I don't know. Right. But I do know that if I am, um, you know, doing what God will, doing God's will and things of that nature, that so much good will come out from that. Mm-hmm. That's so good. And I'm like, I'm looking over these words, uh, verses as you're kind of talking. And I think I remember... Was it the movie Courageous where... I don't remember. It was one of those like Christian flicks that they put out every couple of years to make us feel good. Yeah. I think it was the policemen or this group of policemen who you know were going through a bunch of stuff. And I think there was just family was a big portion of that. Um, and this one guy had lost his daughter especially, and that was pretty hard for him. But oh, he wow. ended up going... They all ended up like reaffirming their relationship with Christ and realizing this is how they got to you know, walk... And he gives this speech at the end of the movie, the guy who had lost his daughter, and he quotes through um, this verse in particular. And so that's like where this has always stuck with me. Also, like seeing in every other Christian household the little, you know, Hobby Lobby painting is as fast for me in my household. So that it's really, really cool. But the the word that stuck out to me was really um, in verse 15 when you started. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in this region of the river or the gods of the Amorites in the land you dwell. So, like, we don't get to choose things with the weight of salvation. Like, we we don't get to choose that. And, like, there's a whole bunch of semantic, you know, theology in terms of, did God choose me? Did I choose God? Like, am I inviting him into my life? Is it, like, how does the the nitty-gritty of that stuff work? I tend to be like, I don't know. Yeah. And so, like, if people want to correct me, go for it like i'm probably wrong like (laughs) like i don't know so but in terms of however you have been saved um and you believe you have been saved from that point where of salvation you now have this choice of how to live your life you you have the choice to follow um you know the gods across the river or the gods of the amorites being the gods of this world who everyone else is serving and those gods are not the God of Israel, those gods are not the God of salvation, the rock and the refuge. Those gods are going to lead you off into different directions, into different places that are not super helpful. Or you can choose to serve the God of gods, Mm -hmm. like the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace, all those cool little things. You make the choice to devote your time to scripture. You make the choice to devote your time to community. You make the choice to come to church. You make the choice to to love one another every single day, you know. And I pray that that 
is a choice that we make gladly and willingly that that choice is not a chore, mm -hmm. you know, because that's certainly a mindset that kind of keeps coming back to me, even as I want to love and serve faithfully and joyously, the less joy that I have in the moment, the more my faith becomes a chore. And I'm like, God, I don't want to be happy right now. Right. I don't, I don't, I don't want to pray right now. I don't want to dig into scripture right now. And, the, and I feel like the more, I guess I'll, I'll bring it back to prayer. The more I can pray through my own mindset and where my heart is at, the more that choice becomes easier. Mm -hmm. And the more I'm willing to say, God, stuff's pretty crappy right now. Yeah. But as for me and my house, I, I choose to serve you today in, in spite of everything that is you are still who you are. Um, you are who you say you are, God. And, you know, walking in that is so freeing and, and liberating. Service is not servanthood or slavehood, even though those analogies are made in terms of our relationship with Christ. But that bondage that which connects us to Christ is not something that denigrates us or like deprecates us. It's something that builds us up and edifies and sanctifies us more than anything else ever could. Absolutely. You know, because I think you talked about earlier how you can't be, uh, you can't serve two masters. You got to choose who you're going to serve. I think about Romans, I want to say six, um, is what it is, and it talks about that slave metaphor really, really explicitly in terms of you don't get to choose whether or not you're a slave is pretty much Paul's message. You're, yeah. you're a slave to something. Mm -hmm. You're always a slave to something. Another way of saying you worship something. You know, you are kind of like bonded to someone mm -hmm. or something. You just get to choose who you're a slave to. Right. You know, and what that slavery is like. You know, whether that slavery is going to look like, you know, this dark depression that you wake up with in the morning where you don't know if you want to face today mm -hmm. or whether that slavery is going to look like, oh, my gosh, I am free from absolutely everything that could ever hold me down because my chain is connected to a God who's constantly bringing me up mm -hmm. and leading me up. He's pulling me out of the dirt and into the light and into grace and mercy and heaven. And that's like a good kind of slavery. Yeah. Like it's it's a weird juxtaposition and a paradox, especially how we traditionally think about slavery right. with all the whips and the civil the war chains. in America. Yeah. It's so like we need to redefine, you know, our notions of, of slavery and service in order to rightly see what God's ex expectations are for our relationship with him and say like, yes, this is meant to be a servanthood thing. This is meant to be bondage, but what bondage looks like is not what you've thought about with, with your earthly masters. There's a certain difference that's so much better and so much bigger when, you, when you're in relationship with God where he makes that toil bearable mm -hmm. and, and he makes the stresses of life manageable and even joyful where you can rejoice in suffering and turn to him and say, God, my chains are, are for your glory yes. right now. And it's, I think... Again, it, go, it goes back into service. It goes back into prayer. And I think that's super cool for one, that you are memorizing that, mm -hmm. you know, that you are laying up this word into your heart. And more than that, you are bringing guys around you who can hold you accountable and say, we are going to lay these words upon our heart. That's actually like the whole plot of Courageous Again, where it's like, I think. I want to say it's like four or five of the police officers where it's like, yes, we're going to be this little band of brothers, this team, and we're going to walk together and we're going to live faithfully and we're going to serve. I mean, you think about police, their whole job is to serve and protect. That's the yeah. motto of the force. <laughs> um, and then, I mean, that's that's God's job as well. He, he serves and protects us. That's I mean, that's our job as fathers, as brothers, is, is to serve and protect um, the, the women in our lives. Also, like, I mean, just our brothers, but, but especially like as guys, I think we are called to a certain level of service and protection to our future spouses, to, to any girl we interact with in terms of chivalry is probably a misnomer for it, but just treating women the way God treats us as yeah, his bride, as his you know, yeah, uh -huh. the way he serves us and, and would die for us to make us look good. Yes. You know, that's, that's, I think something that we miss a lot, but that certainly we could come back to, especially if more of us would take the, I mean, follow in your footsteps and, and, and just be so servant hearted and, and so servant minded and servant leaderly. Uh, I couldn't think of like a, an adjective for that, but <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's awesome. Yeah, so it's, it's awesome. It's God really, really good, good stuff. Mm -hmm. He is good. It's proud. Yeah. And I think, did you have anything else to say on that? Um, no, I pretty much summed it up. I just, so as I was reading through that, I kind of flipped through Joshua. Heck and yeah. Another verse that really just like stuck out to me. This is a, a verse that's really well known. Joshua 1.9. Heck yeah. Um, 
Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. So as we're, we're talking about slavery, like, you know, I feel like sometimes we have this idea that, like, the slave masters, like, only comes to the slaves when they're, like, in trouble. Like, will mm-hmm. come and, like, you know, punish them or whatnot. But God is always with us. And he is, yes, we're, we're enslaved to Christ, but he is, you know, a good father. He is mm-hmm. a loving slave master, you know, one who is always there to pick us up whenever we mess up not to scold us but to correct us to say hey you're still my you're still my child i love you to death literally god loves us to death and um you know knowing that we do not need to be scared about this world because i'm very i'm very i am still very uh, i don't want to say scaredy cat but yeah scaredy cat very timid person uh, about college very nervous coming here very nervous to like go through my endeavors but god says do not be dismayed for i am <laughs> with you always and it says that in um in uh, isaiah forty one ten as well do not fear for i am with you and all throughout the bible god tells us to not be afraid and to not um let the fears of our of our earthly lives overcome or get in the way of our relationship yeah. because it does and mm-hmm. it, when it does it's such it's so difficult to come to grips mm-hmm. with but we have to have that um that spiritual discipline to realize that if we just um have our relationship with christ and understand that he is good and loving that we can do go back to philippians all things to christ yeah no, and I, and I definitely wanted to return to Philippians because, for one, we were talking about it earlier, and I just like really like that verse. But especially as it applies to your personal story, having known you for a little bit, like you said, um, coming in as a freshman, you were a little bit shy, and I think some of that's just like the freshman bug where you don't know anybody, yeah, and, and you're trying to get acquainted. Certainly, but I know having heard your story, that was a big, big part of your testimony um, going through high school and how, you know, just this this very shy kid didn't quite know how to express yourself trying to find out who am I, how do I make my faith my own faith and, mm-hmm. and declare that faith to the world. But knowing you now and where you've come, even from freshman year, it is it is night and day in terms of just courage and fearlessness. You quoted Joshua 1.9, and I think that really resonates with you personally mm-hmm. because you, you are incredibly bold um, to the point where like, I don't want to like make fun of you or anything, but like it, it's a silly boldness in a way. Yeah. Be- because you are truly so carefree in your declaration of the gospel that like you're willing to play the fool for Christ and kind of make the like the question you asked yesterday in Bible <laughs> study. Like I died laughing, but it but it it, it um it was a testament to this. I'll share it with everybody now if you don't mind. <laughs> sure, go for it. Okay, so we have this like quote of the day board for freshman Bible study. Um, and it's usually just something ridiculous that comes up in conversation or, you know, someone says something weird. And yesterday, Aiden, as he was leading, it wasn't even like an introduction question. It was just closing out. We were about to leave the day behind and, and we didn't need to have this conversation, but we did because Aiden asked the question was, if you could date any Bible character, who would it be and why? No, no not even that. Just your biblical crush your biblical crush okay that's what it was and like i had never thought about that before (laughs) at all and i still don't want to think about it but it it was just like this it's one of those things where again it's just kind of like this courage and this silliness and this playfulness where you are unafraid to make a joke like that Mm -hmm. you know it's just kind of like it has the same effect of like a dad joke where like did did this really just happen (laughs) like did did, did aiden really just say this right now but but it's like like who like who even because it's just the fun and the joy of thinking i mean god is good let's let's celebrate and be a little weird for a bit i don't know god (laughs) loves us yeah like yeah i i was trying to think of maybe that wasn't the best example in terms of just like radical courage but i think carefree is probably a better word and like in terms of anxiety going back to philippians and, and courage i think there's a certain care there's a certain freeness from care and from worry that Christ gives us that allows you to be so bubbly and so just like lighthearted and to be the light in the darkness, you know, wherever you are, mm-hmm. which, which is awesome to watch and see, you know? Yeah. I, I know, right on. Uh, I do. One thing I've really um, tried to go about is that, um, you know, Christ did die for us. We live, um, you know, in, in like, in, in constant joy of that. And that's yeah. one thing that I've, I've noticed and other people have commented to me and I try not to let it like, you know, go to your head or anything. Yeah. You know, be humble through it, but like realize that, um, if God is using me through like 
through my bubbliness, through my like fearness or fear fearlessness. There you go. <laughs> that fearness. Uh, I'm sure that adjectives well. are getting really hard today. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but just like just doing what I can to just um, you know, make someone's day better, put a smile on their face. It's yeah. one thing that. Even from elementary school, I learned to, I was kind of the class clown in my, you know, little elementary school, like crack mm-hmm. jokes, but like seeing people smile, making people laugh. They say laughter is the best medicine, and it I is. completely believe that. I believe yeah. that you can, um, if you can make someone's day better, that just, it just does so much good. I mean, people have different, you know, nitpicky arguments about that, but that's besides the point. Just well, understanding. Yeah. <laughs> <that> we, <laughs> I think I know where you're going. We, we have a lot of same opinions on that, and I'd love to dig into it a little bit if you're fine. Because yeah. I think you're, I think you're talking about, um, like laughter in the church and like whether like you can make jokes about God and religion or whether or not that's like respectful, yeah. disrespectful. I, I have a lot of opinions about that. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> you know, the only thing I try to do is, you know, not take God's name in vain. Right. You know, we can't, yes. you know, be joking about that or making fun of God because that's mm-hmm. um, breaking a commandment. But um, honestly, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're going to, um, you know, as long as you're being respectful of others, mm-hmm. as long as you're, you know, being respectful of God, I feel like you can, you know, have fun. I mean, we do yeah. with our our church. We have our uh, our the guys group, and we just crack oh, jokes in there. Yeah, it's... memes are really helpful. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a good medium for wholesome humor. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I think that's just the the key word there is wholesome, and not that because because my big contention I think with a lot of people even within the Christian bubble is is what's considered wholesome and what's considered you know not PG and what you can even like talk about and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, Especially in terms of either a darker humor, because my humor tends to be a little bit twisted, because yeah. cause I just, I can think of that way. And the thing about dark humor in particular is that the the darker it is and the more inappropriate it is, is in of itself what makes it funny. Mm-hmm. Because the irony that you create with a wholesome joke has to come from the content. Right. And, it, and it has to be the content working within itself where, you know, Here's a bunny riding in a unicycle. What bunnies can't ride unicycles? That's kind of funny. Yeah. You know, the, the irony is the bunny shouldn't be riding the unicycle. Whereas if I make a joke about, you know, uh, I'm not doing it right now, but like if, when someone makes a dead baby joke, sure, like the thing of itself that's funny is that you're talking about dead babies, mm-hmm. right? You shouldn't be allowed to talk about dead babies and you shouldn't be allowed to laugh at dead babies. But as soon as someone does, it makes it even more funny because the irony is is the context of the joke itself, right? Right. I'd say that if you're going to do like a wholesome Christian meme, you cannot use that as like an evangelism tool. Like it has to be someone. <laughs> it has to be someone who like knows, understands the context well, and knows where they're coming from. Because yes. if you go and like, you know, share Christian memes, people, it, it might it might be like I might be overanalyzing this, but it might not be the best way to reach out to others. You mm. know, through that. Um, but if you're doing so in like a group of believers who understand the context, understand why it's funny and right. why it's a joke, you know, yes. um, then it's, I think it's perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and definitely keeping the spirit of, you know, edifying one another and not wanting to make other people the heart of jokes. Correct. Um, I think Chris Rock had this bit, um, a while ago and he was really just talking about comedy. He's like, you want to make fun of what people do and not who they are. Mm-hmm. And so it's like actions, like the irony within, like, uh, I think that's honestly why religious humor is so funny. And I've, and I've touched on it with a couple of different people is that when people make jokes about God, um, on the stage, I watch a ton of Netflix originals. I'm just like kind of inculcated with all of these different religious jokes that I'm probably going to go for like to hell for listening to <laughs> and like laughing at, but it's like, the reason why those jokes are so funny is because they deny every expectation of God being who he says he is or for the church living up to who God expects them to be. Mm-hmm. Um, the primary example being like scandal within the church or, yeah. the, or the history of just, you know, the Crusades is a big one where it's like, oh, thou shalt not murder? Tell that to like 1567 and like y'all in the Middle East, you know, mm-hmm. something, something along those lines, usually a lot more vulgar than that. Or personifying God with such human flaws and characteristics, the the humor and the irony in that rests in the hypocrisy, yes. um, which I think is so very interesting because it reveals to us something that I think as the church we're very uncomfortable with, mm-hmm. which is our own hypocrisy. And I think Pastor Homan said it a bunch, is that like as Christians, we have to learn to embrace the title of hypocrite. And in a way laugh at ourselves again not take the name of the lord in vain and not like let him like be dishonored in any type of way but also realizing there's a certain heart that comedians in particular have that is this playful ignorance Mm -hmm. where they're not trying to 
take God off of his pedestal. They're trying to poke fun at reality. Yeah. And it's, a lot of it is truly just raw semantics in terms of, oh, isn't this neat? How like this is supposed to happen, but this is what actually happens. Yeah. You know, and finding different ways to explain that and expose that to people. So I don't think there's a whole lot of malevolence. You've got like the George Carlins of the world who yeah. are just like, that's their bit. But even then, it's like it is a bit, you know, and I and I doubt a lot of people or the grand majority of people, especially people who laugh at the jokes, because laughter, again, is a response. Mm -hmm. It's not like everyone who laughs at a joke that kind of like defames Christianity or religion is anti-religion. Right. They just recognize the humor and the hypocrisy and the irony of, wow, the world's broken and busted, which I'm like... There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah like, it is like, what it is. And I think in, in, I think in the purest sense, um, I'm definitely going beyond my pay grade here. Something that I... Th yeah, I'm definitely going above my pay grade. That, like, God can work through the weirdest of mediums to, to make oh, himself known. Absolutely. Because I know there's quite a few times when I've heard jokes or heard people say things making fun of religion or I've been like either upset enough or just confused enough to go back to scripture or to pray to God and be like, what? Or, or it, kinda, it brings that thought again into consciousness where you start to think about these things and realize, wait a minute, there's a discussion to be had here, mm -hmm. right? And so while this guy might be blasting religion on from the stage, everybody in the audience is going to go home thinking a little bit more about, the was that real? Mm -hmm. Like, clearly it was a joke, but like how much of it was a joke? You got to go home and fact check yourself. And like, those are the moments where God, I think, starts working. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really valuable. And we shouldn't deny the conversation for the sake of what we're comfortable with, mm -hmm. you know, which is really, really big. And I definitely went on a rant there because, again, I have a lot of opinions in that department. No, but th yeah. that's completely fair. I mean, our God is a creative God, and mm -hmm. he, makes his, he makes himself known to us in the craziest ways you yeah. know, through chemistry. This kind of ties back to our earlier discussion, mm -hmm. this chemistry, or through, I don't even know, jokes about Christian Bible crushes, you know? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, whatever it may be, God, you know, he is so creative and so intelligent to make his name known in the weirdest ways, you know, mm -hmm. um, through comedy, through tragedy, through whatever it may be, um, because God wants to make his name, his name known throughout, throughout the world. And he can, he, God has the power to do that in the craziest ways. It boggles my mind how God reveals himself to me through things as mundane as walking to campus, like yeah. looking at, looking at trees and birds and hearing like when the, when, the, when, um, when it got warmer, like that one time it did, I heard the birds chirping. I'm like, this is new. Like, I didn't yeah. hear this in December. <laughs> there are birds in College Station. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And just hearing hearing them chirp, it was really, like, juvenile in a way, but it was like, yeah. like this is cool. You know, God is good. Um, and God's creation. Oh, what was the verse? There's a verse in, in the Psalms that I've been kind of um, referring back to. I'll flip back to it every once in a while. I wanna, I'm wondering if it's um, applicable. Yeah. So uh, Psalm 19, 1, where it says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Like mm. literally we see God's, um, his handiwork throughout all of our life, throughout, um, you know, his, his, his creation in addition to, you know, cause you're his creation too, Heck yeah. through like yeah. other people, through, um, what we discover as, as humans, as we go throughout our lives, um, we're constantly surrounded by things that God has done for us. Mm. Yeah, that's so, so big. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I love how you just, again, brought it back into Scripture. And it's literally the, the heavens and earth all declaring the same revealed God to us, different facets of it, certainly. And there are different ways and mediums with which God reveals himself to us, whether that's vocation, whether that's community, whether that's like the special revelation of his word, which is like so, so cool that we've been able to come back to that so much um, today and this morning. Um, and yeah, that's that's really, really good. Um, it just also comes back to community, I think, is a, a big way that he reveals himself to us just in terms of being able to bounce ideas off of each other, not only one-on-one -on -one as we're doing now, but in freshman Bible study, in Flick, as y'all have committee meetings and stuff, as y'all are going through, I mean, y'all have guy-girl time and stuff like that where you're not only serving, but you're actually building relationship with one another mm -hmm. and seeing God reflected through each person in that group, which is so, so amazing. Um, and, and brings me into, I think, what we were hoping to talk about all this morning um, is a new potential opportunity for community here oh, at the chapel yes. that's <laughs> goes by the name of beta, beta sigma, sigma psi <laughs> talk oh. about that for us aiden Broyles. okay oh wow where do i start 
<laughs> he opened up the whole can of worms. Got so, him. <laughs> so um, what started out as a joke, um, <laughs> what really was a joke. Yeah. Um, you know, I went to this convention in Fort Wayne, Indiana, called the Witness Convention. A um, bunch of LCMS college youth, kind of sharing their life, sharing like learning how to be witnesses of Christ on our campuses. Um, there was a table there with a guy named Andrew, and uh, he was with Beta Sigma Psi uh, National Fraternity, and. We, we just struck up a con- I was just like walking around the booths, struck up a conversation with him about like what they do, where they're at. And he asked me, well, where do you go to college? I said, Texas A&M. He said, oh, we, don't, we had a chapter there. <laughs> Not anymore. Basically, we talked for like another um, couple minutes. He, he sent me with the um, kind of the, uh, the how manual. How-to guide. Yeah, how-to guide for beta, how to be beta sig. And I, I, we, were, we were in a leadership meeting, and I just said, hey, pastor. Just slammed on the desk, and his eyes got. He's like, "Where did you get that?" <laughs> it turns out, pastors and alumni of Beta Sig, um, and so through talking with people, and um, I kind of like see like, is this something we want to do? Is this like something like we're gonna ha ha? This be fun, but not really do. Yeah. Um, and initially, it started out like that. Like we were like ha ha Beta Sig ha ha. But then I uh, I sent uh, about about two weeks ago. I sent an email to the main office in um, St. Louis or a suburb of St. Louis. And I said, um, we're interested in starting a chapter here. And they didn't respond. I'm like, oh, yeah, they're probably like not super interested. Well, a week later, they respond and say, no, we want to have a call. We want to call you and see like, um, like where you are right now. And I said, okay, cool. So I called them on Tuesday night, last Tuesday. Right. And I basically said, like, this is what we got. This is what we want to do. And that night I received like three, four emails from different people saying, okay, if you need any help, let me know. I know a buddy in here who can help you. Like, just so crazy, mm-hmm. like such an immediate response. And it feels like there are people who want this fraternity to start here. And, um, and now, like we've like we have like the official like starting mm-hmm. manual. Like literally, like okay, this is where we start. And Here's your starters kit. <laughs> it, exactly. Like, and it's it's happening. And I'm just like, I'm like, okay, is, yeah. I, like I feel like this is um. You know, because next year, like, Flick will end for me. Obviously, mm-hmm. um, won't be director, at least not thinking about it right now. Okay. Um, and so I, I was praying to God. I'm like, God, I need a good community. You know, mm-hmm. I want a good group of people. And literally, like, a week ago, God's like, okay, what about this? And I'm yeah. like, okay, sure. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, it's it, – um, I really do think – if if this happens, it'll be a really good community with a bunch of guys at the chapel who are already really close mm-hmm. just to kind of – um, make it a bit more interesting, do it a bit more yeah. in a different way. Right. And I think I kind of jokingly asked you, like, what would we actually do different? Because we're kind of like a pseudo fraternity already within like the guys group me and like the guys Bible study. We, we're incredibly close. Yeah. You know, to where I think I just jokingly asked you, like, what will be different except for the fact that we have stickers? You're like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that um, as I was thinking about it a little more, I was going home yesterday and thinking about it. I'm like, what would actually be different about this? And it's that we'd be part of something so much bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, we get to be a part of a network of communities and a network of believers and a network of guys who are trying to go out into college campuses and, and make the name of Jesus known. Yeah, because they're all throughout America. Yeah. And not only that, but I think do that in a way which, and this isn't super important to me, but it again is really, really neat, who come from a, a same background where the knit pieces, the nitty gritties of doctrine kind of line up a little bit more. And so hopefully that's a spirit of unity that we can lean into together and say, okay, let's go from this place of unity forward and let's like let's pick a direction let's find a target and like let's go above and beyond that target in terms of reaching out to people serving the community finding people to come into the organization to build them up to build up these relationships and continue to refine one another use iron to sharpen iron Mm -hmm. to make brothers in christ who i mean i think pastor still talks with some of his fraternity brothers is what he was telling us so like and beyond you know the, the relationships, again, that we have here are always always incredibly close. And we have the chapel in Christ that unite us, this space and, and this person who bring us together. But I think also having a face that we can represent a lot more officially mm-hmm. and say, look, here is an organization dedicated to bringing up men who 
love the Lord and who want to serve the Lord and who want to serve the community. Um, and I think that the networking thing is really, really big because uh, something I've felt here at the chapel, it's it's small and I love that it's tight knit, but I've, I've always wanted to network with the churches around not only the city, but around the state and around the country, you know, in terms of like, let's Let's be Christ's image of the church, you know, like unity without necessarily uniformity, celebrating diversity of opinion and background, and, and again, pushing forward to that same goal. And I think just being a part of Beta Sig, a national organization, was a great way to network and, and, you know, have more conventions, have more conferences, and just bounce ideas off of each other so we can learn and grow um, and stuff like that. It's, it's more than just like a couple of Greek letters on a sticker. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it definitely can be this place where we... Um, are just a bigger body of believers and we can start to recognize that again we are a part of a mission that is so much bigger than ourselves Mm -hmm. and that God is using thousands of people like us um, to to accomplish his same mission you know which which should build us up you know we're not in this fight alone yeah which is really really cool Mm -hmm. yeah no absolutely it is it definitely um, going to the 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 convention or the conference I guess um, was very eye-opening for me because you know, here at AM we have a very small LCMS population, or at least an active one. I mean, there might be other LCMS people on campus that just aren't. Yeah. Well, because we have Holy Cross and Bethel kind of down the road. Yeah. But I'm not sure either of them does active college ministry, which is interesting. But I think they, in theory, funnel towards us. <laughs> right. <laughs> in theory. Yeah, they, they try to push them here. But, um, yeah. but like, there's groups there from, I think, University of Northern Iowa that was, like, a huge group, you know, all had, like, you know, matching shirts. And I was thinking... <laughs> What, this could be University Lutheran Chapel here at College Station someday. We could get, we could be the biggest group there. And it was a very um, probably bold statement, but it's kind of like a, um, a uh, kind of like a. Uh, it was is eye opening in the way that there's a bunch of people all throughout America who are going through the same academic struggles, same you know, emotional mental struggles that I am. Um, that I don't even know of because God's yeah. kingdom is so large and mm-hmm. you know we have a very limited view just of like what a and m like obviously here it's the Christian bubble here it's the um you know the the people here that that do their thing and probably um you know they love God but they might not I don't know what the best word is yeah I think I think you're hitting at something which is um interesting to me and what I've been working through is that within a and m in particular, there is so much room to learn Mm -hmm. um, from campus ministry um, and about campus journey ministry because we're probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest college towns in the United States. And we are centered in the buckle of the Bible Belt, Mm -hmm. which has, you know, kind of naturally or supernaturally produced this abundance of fruit in that we've got places like Breakaway and Impact and Flick and and all these amazing like pretty much mega churches around town oh, yeah. where where they are incredibly connected and again networked in a way that they are pursuing the same goal and I've thought the chapel in particular um, is is special because we get to be a small little group in the midst of a very big pond with a lot of very big fish that we can learn from. And I think it's important, again, to not only network with the people around the country, but also especially in College Station, because I think if if any city has learned and had to learn how to do campus ministry, people in College Station hopefully have learned it well or, you know, somewhere near the best or adequate, you know. And so I think it'd be incredibly valuable um, for the chapel to be going out elsewhere yeah. you know to, to take what we learned from college station and from brian and all the churches and the friends that we have here who practice their faith and live it out and to bring that into particularly campus ministry whether it's the northern united states or the east coast or the west coast and say like this is what we're learning in college station bible belt texas mm-hmm. and humbly speaking there's a lot to learn from from this place, not right. necessarily from me or from you or from us, but just from from this place where so much fruit is being born. It's like, let's see where the trees start popping up. Let's see how they start popping up, where the seeds are planted, how they're planted, so we can we can spread the information and we can sow a little bit better and, and cleaner and bear more fruit. So I think that's... Was that what you're talking about a little bit? Yeah, like just making yeah. it a, um, a bigger picture kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's definitely... Uh, a unique situation here because this city has big picture in mind. Mm-hmm. Um, 
especially within the church and the Christian bubble, there are little niches and cliques and life groups and stuff like that, which are totally beautiful and amazing, you know, yeah. and none of them intend to be divisive at all. If anything, they want to be unified. It's just kind of figuring out how, when, and where. You know, I think Breakaway is a really, really good example of that because you've got everyone in Reed Arena. Mm-hmm. And it just, I mean, up to like, Five, six, seven thousand people. I don't want to put a random number on it, but I think that's a close estimate, at least week one, week two. Yeah, absolutely. You know, where you see a city come together, Mm -hmm. you know, not just a mega church come together, even though there's amazing, like you see a city of believers, of young adult believers who are encouraged and empowered to proclaim the gospel and go out. And I think this city has the ability and it does go out into the country and into the world and to share not only Christ, but, you know, the the how to share Christ, so, you know, yeah, sharing the how to share. I don't know. Yeah, but one thing that kind of reminds me as I was, you were t- mentioning this is remember how like God uses comedy to like like Heck the craziest yeah. ways. God's using a research institution mm. to make His name known. Mm-hmm. People here at A and M, you know, because we we do all believe the simple gospel. People, yeah, God's using things like Breakaway, things like you know the Grace Andersons, the Grace Southwoods, the um, the big churches, the little churches, whatever you want to call it the flicks, the um, Christian organizations. He's using all of them to spread God's name throughout Texas, throughout the throughout uh, America, and then people going abroad. He's God is using A and M as a sec, it's a, which is a secular institution mm-hmm. to make his name known. Yeah, which is which is cool. I mean, God is creative. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, he he certainly is, and I think for as much we we certainly have it lucky here, and I don't think we realize how lucky we have it, especially at Texas A&M, where I personally have not seen an antagonism to, oh, yeah, to I mean, religion on, on behalf of, you know, students, teachers, administrators, policy, like whatever that may be. Like there, there is so much love in Aggieland and that's, you know, a big point of pride for us. We, we like to celebrate the diversity and, and stuff like that and tradition as well, mm-hmm. which usually don't go a whole really well together, yeah. you know, but, but I mean, A&M does what it does. We certainly have a majority Christian population here. Not going to discount that as a factor. Like, right. it helps when you make up a great big portion of everything to, in terms of, like, your comfort making the name known because chances are you could run into somebody who already agrees with you. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're not running into a whole lot of opposition there, and anybody who's coming in who doesn't believe in Christ kind of understands the climate, knows that if they go around bashing on God, they are going to have a whole lot of opposition from yeah. the Christian bubble <laughs> almost immediately and on social media and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So we, we are in a privileged place, but again, in, in a mission field, you know, it, oh, yeah. it doesn't make anything crystal clear or crystal super easy. I didn't think of a good no, thing sure. there. Right. It, does, it doesn't make anything immediately available in terms of r- reaching out and, and converting people. Like it's not just like when you talk to somebody and boom, right. You know, it, but it, certainly helps yeah <laughs> it really really helps because you almost have just a radical version of peer pressure mm-hmm. where not only i mean america i think as much as we try to or as much as i've heard that the trend is going in the opposite direction is still one of the most consistently religiously affiliated countries in the world yeah as opposed you know, to some of the countries in right like i mean africa i think is like in terms of direction and where it's headed is is headed so much further oh, yeah. than us you know the direction i think they're pointed to christ a lot more whereas we tend to be like weaning a little bit off but in terms of sheer number of what we have right now you know it's it's like we we are very very blessed to be where we are oh, absolutely we're not in you know europe or eastern europe or mm-hmm. you know any anywhere where our beliefs are repressed and even at a campus like like where I was talking to a student from Purdue University, yeah. and they're like they're they're very similar to us in a lot of ways, like you know, agriculture, engineering yeah. campus. But there, if you like, if you're out like street preaching or whatever here, A and M people won't mind. But there, like you'll get you know, it's not good. Like you'll get really? you'll get attacked. Yeah, but you'll get ridiculed, and and it's very interesting to think that in a, you know, Purdue being up in the Midwest, kind of where there's a lot of LCMS folk hmm. okay. that it's very it's it's i mean they're not in the bible belt so yeah. it's it's kind of a whole different attitude towards christianity there in indiana mm-hmm. than it is here in college station yeah which is i've i would have i mean and i hope maybe in the like near distant future to kind of like go campus traveling and stuff yeah. like that i don't know if i'd be like a traveling preacher or anything like that <laughs> but, but just to kind of see 
the, the state of the union, you know, in terms of churches and campus ministries I'd across the country. Yeah, it would be so fun. Yeah, and I think the convention, I wish I had gone now in terms of just like I getting the. You would have loved it. Yeah, to compare notes with everybody across the nation. But yeah, we, we're, we're super, super lucky. Um, but I think, I mean, again, if, if there's somebody preaching at Purdue, it means Christ is still there. That's true. It doesn't matter like how well that's received. It means somebody's trying. And as long as somebody's trying and if somebody's faithful, God's going to bear fruit. And so, like, I'm, you know, hopeful in that respect that that god's just going to be who he says he is Mm -hmm. you know and that however much the seed kind of falls among the thorns that it doesn't completely get choked out Mm -hmm. you know that the word does bear fruit um and that faithfulness is rewarded you know yeah um it'd be great if it was rewarded a lot more in like terms of like 30s and hundreds but (laughs) yeah it's it is it is what it is man yeah it's it's really really good and i think i mean we kind of tangented off this but beta sig man well what a platform i know I mean, what a, what a network to have, hopefully, you know, within the next year or so that we can start, I mean, pouring in, pouring out, being poured into, pouring out, I don't know. Mm-hmm, sure. Words are slowly evaporating yeah. from my brain in terms of where this morning's been and where it's going. But it's been, I mean, it's been good talking yeah. with you. Anything else that you wanted to hit on? Anything you're thinking about? No, I think just um, it's cool how God um, will be, will like, will, will work in your life. And you don't always realize it. Like, yeah. I... I didn't realize that God was like slowly bringing me to where I'm at right now, like at A&M with Flick, with ULC, now possibly with Beta Sig. Mm-hmm. Like it's been a long process, but God's slowly been manifesting like what He what His will for my life throughout all kinds of all kinds of stories, and it's so cool to see. Yeah, bro, that's awesome. I'm so glad to have you on, bud. Yeah, been, thanks for inviting cool. me. Yeah, it's been really cool. Tradition has it that you could pray us out. Are you good with that? Oh, absolutely. Heck yeah. Alrighty. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful morning. Uh, thank you for Cody and just inviting me on just to, to talk about life, to talk about what God's doing um, in my life and in His. And we're so thankful for the amazing things you've done in both of our lives um, for just giving us, for bringing us to this point here um, on a Saturday morning here in College Station just to, to talk about uh, talk about you and uh, the amazing things you're doing. God, if you would have told me I'd be where I'm at right now, um, three years ago, I would have laughed and been like, no, you're crazy. Um, but you are creative is probably the better word. Um, you are so amazing, and um, I'm in awe of all that you've done, and for me uh, and for the lives of others. Um, and I pray that you just um, help us to be bold, to share your faith. Um, give us the, the creativity to um, to just reach the lost and to bring them to you um, However that may look, we don't know, but we know that you're doing amazing things here on this campus, and we thank you for loving us and for sending your son Jesus to die so that we can um, have the joy that comes from knowing that we are going to be with, uh, with you for all eternity. In your name we pray, amen.